Chapter eighteen of Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Nordell. Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume five by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter eighteen The Shiloh Campaign the fall of fort donelson hastened almost to a panic the retreat of the confederates from other points by that surrender about one-third of their fighting force in tennessee vanished from the campaign while their whole web of strategy was instantly dissolved the full possession of the tennessee river by the union gunboats for the moment hopelessly divided the confederate commands and like a flushed covey of birds the rebel generals started on their several lines of retreat without concert or rallying point albert sidney johnston the department commander moved southeast towards chattanooga abandoning nashville to its fate while beauregard left to his own discretion and resources took measures to effect the evacuation of columbus so as to save its armament and supplies and then proceeded to the railroad crossings of northern mississippi to collect and organize a new army it is now evident that if the union forces could have been promptly moved forward in harmonious combination with the facility which the opening of the tennessee river afforded them such an advance might have been made and such strategic points gained and held as would have saved at least an entire year of campaign and battle in the west unfortunately this great advantage was not seized and in the condition of affairs could not be and a delay of a fortnight or more enabled the insurgents to renew the confidence and gather the forces to establish another line farther to the south and again to interpose a formidable resistance one cause of this inefficiency and delay of the union commanders may be easily gleaned from the dispatches interchanged by them within a few days succeeding the fall of fort donelson and which aside from their military bearings form an interesting study of human nature general buell from his headquarters at louisville wrote on february seventeenth eighteen sixty two that since the reinforcements nelson's division started by him to assist at fort donelson were no longer needed he had ordered them back the object of both our forces he continued is directly or indirectly to strike at the power of the rebellion in its most vital point within our field nashville appears clearly i think to be that point he thought further that heavy reinforcements would soon be thrown into it by the rebels the leisurely manner in which he expected to strike at this heart of the rebellion appears from these words in the same letter to depend on wagons at this season for a large force seems out of the question and i fear it may be two weeks before i can get a bridge over the barren river so as to use the railroad beyond i shall endeavor however to make an advance in less or much force before that time let me hear your views halleck at st louis was agitated by more rapid emotions watching the distant and dangerous campaign under curtis in southwestern missouri beginning another of mingled hazard and brilliant promise under pope on the mississippi beset by perplexities of local administration flushed to fever heat by the unexpected success of grant his mind ran forward eagerly to new prospects i am not satisfied with present success he telegraphed to sherman we must now prepare for a still more important movement you will not be forgotten in this but this preparation seems in his mind to have involved something more than orders from himself before he received the news of the surrender of fort donelson he became seriously alarmed lest the rebels using their river transportation might rapidly concentrate attack grant in the rear crush him before succor could reach him and returning quickly be as ready as before to confront and oppose buell even after the surrender halleck manifests a continuing fear that some indefinite concentration will take place and a quick reprisal be executed by a formidable expedition against paducah or cairo his overstrained appeals to buell for help do not seem justified in the full light of history an undertone of suggestion and demand indicates that this urgency while based on his patriotic eagerness for success was not wholly free from personal ambition we have seen how when he heard of grant's victory he generously asked that buell grant and pope be made major generals of volunteers and with equal generosity to himself broadly added and give me command in the west he could not agree with buell that nashville was the most vital point of the rebellion in the west and that heavy rebel reinforcements would be thrown into it from all quarters east and south halleck develops his idea with great earnestness in replying to that suggestion from buell he says to remove all questions as to rank i have asked the president to make you a major general come down to the cumberland and take command the battle of the west is to be fought in that vicinity 
You should be in it as the ranking general in immediate command. Don't hesitate. Come to Clarksville as rapidly as possible. Say that you will come, and I will have everything there for you. Beauregard threatens to attack either Cairo or Paducah. I must be ready for him. Don't stop any troops ordered down the Ohio. We want them all. You shall have them back in a few days. Assistant Secretary of War Scott left here this afternoon to confer with you. He knows my plans and necessities. I am terribly hard pushed. Help me and I will help you. Hunter has acted nobly, generously, bravely. Without his aid, I should have failed before Fort Donelson. Honor to him. We came within an ace of being defeated. If the fragments which I sent down had not reached there on Saturday, we should have gone in. A retreat at one time seemed almost inevitable. All right now. Help me to carry it out. Talk freely with Scott. It is evident to me that you and McClellan did not, at last accounts, appreciate the strait I have been in. I am certain you will when you understand it all. Help me, I beg of you. Throw all your troops in the direction of the Cumberland. Don't stop anyone ordered here. You will not regret it. There will be no battle at Nashville. In answer to an inquiry from Assistant Secretary Scott, he explained further, I mean that Buell should move on Clarksville with his present column, there unite his Kentucky army, and move up the Cumberland, while I act on the Tennessee. We should then be able to cooperate. This proposal was entirely judicious, but in Halleck's mind it was subordinated to another consideration, namely that he should exercise superior command in the West. Again he telegraphed to McClellan on February 19th, Give it, the Western Division, to me, and I will split secession in twain in one month. The same confidence is also expressed to Buell in a simultaneous dispatch to Assistant Secretary Scott, who was with Buell. If General Buell will come down and help me with all possible haste, we can end the war in the West in less than a month. A day later, Halleck becomes almost peremptory in a dispatch to McClellan. I must have command of the armies in the West. Hesitation and delay are losing us the golden opportunity. Lay this before the President and Secretary of War. May I assume the command? Answer quickly. To this direct interrogatory, McClellan replied in the negative. The request was hardly couched in proper terms to find ready acquiescence from a military superior. In this case, however, it was also calculated to rouse a twofold instinct of jealousy. Buell was a warm personal friend of McClellan, and the latter could not be expected to diminish the opportunities or endanger the chances of his favorite. But more important yet was the question how this sudden success in Halleck's department and the extension of command and power so boldly demanded might affect McClellan's own standing and authority. He was yet general-in-chief, but the administration was dissatisfied at his inaction, and the president had indicated in the general war order requiring all the armies of the United States to move on the 22nd of February that his patience had a limit. McClellan did not believe that the army under his own immediate care and command would be ready to fulfill the president's order. Should he permit a rival to arise in the West and grasp a great victory before he could move? An hour after midnight, McClellan answered Halleck as follows. Buell at Bowling Green knows more of the state of affairs than you at St. Louis. Until I hear from him, I cannot see necessity of giving you entire command. I expect to hear from Buell in a few minutes. I do not yet see that Buell cannot control his own line. I shall not lay your request before the secretary until I hear definitely from Buell. Halleck did not feel wholly baffled by the unfavorable response. That day he received a dispatch from Stanton, who said, Your plan of organization has been transmitted to me by Mr. Scott and strikes me very favorably, but on the account of the domestic affliction of the president, I have not yet been able to submit it to him. The brilliant result of the energetic action in the West fills the nation with joy. Encouraged by this friendly tone from the Secretary of War, Halleck ventured a final appeal. One whole week has been lost already by hesitation and delay. There was, and I think there still is, a golden opportunity to strike a fatal blow. But I can't do it unless I can control Buell's army. I am perfectly willing to act as General McClellan dictates or to take any amount of responsibility. To succeed, we must be prompt. I have explained everything to General McClellan and Assistant Secretary Scott. There is not a moment to be lost. Give me authority, and I will be responsible for results. Doubtless Halleck felt that the fates were against him, for the reply chilled his lingering hopes. Your telegram of yesterday, together with Mr. Scott's reports, have this morning been submitted to the President, who, after full consideration of the subject, does not think any change in the organization of the Army or the military departments at present advisable. 
He desires and expects you and General Buell to cooperate fully and zealously with each other, and would be glad to know whether there has been any failure of cooperation in any particular. Mr. Lincoln had been watching by the bedside of his dying son, and in his overwhelming grief probably felt disinclined to touch this new vexation of military selfishness, a class of questions from which he always shrank with the utmost distaste. Besides, we shall see in due time how the President's momentary decision turned upon much more comprehensive changes already in contemplation. Before McClellan's refusal to enlarge Halleck's command, he had indicated that his judgment and feelings were with Buell. Thus he telegraphed the latter on February 20. Halleck says Columbus reinforced from New Orleans, and steam up on their boats ready for move, probably on Cairo. Wishes to withdraw some troops from Donelson. I tell him improbable that rebels are reinforced from New Orleans or attack Cairo. Think they will abandon Columbus. How soon can you be in front of Nashville and in what force? What news of the rebels? If the force in West can take Nashville or even hold its own for the present, I hope to have Richmond and Norfolk in from three to four weeks. He sent a similar dispatch to Halleck in which he pointed out Nashville as the pressing objective. Buell has gone to Bowling Green. I will be in communication with him in a few minutes, and we will then arrange. The fall of Clarksville confirms my views. I think Cairo is not in danger, and that we must now direct our efforts on Nashville. The rebels hold firm at Manassas. In less than two weeks I shall move the Army of the Potomac, and hope to be in Richmond soon after you are in Nashville. I think Columbus will be abandoned within a week. We will have a desperate battle on this line. While the three generals were discussing high strategy and grand campaigns by telegraph, and probably deliberating with more anxiety the possibilities of personal fame, the simple soldiering of Grant and Foote was solving some of the problems that confused scientific hypothesis. They quietly occupied Clarksville, which the enemy abandoned, and even while preparing to do so, Grant suggested in his dispatch of February 19, If it is the desire of the general commanding department, I can have Nashville on Saturday week. Foote repeated the suggestion in a dispatch on February 21st, but the coveted permission did not come in time. Meanwhile, Buell, having gone to Bowling Green to push forward his railroad bridge and hearing of the fall of Clarksville and the probable abandonment of Nashville, moved on by forced marches with a single division reaching the Cumberland opposite the city on the 25th. The enemy had burned the bridge, and he could not cross, but almost simultaneously he witnessed the arrival of steamboats bringing General Nelson's division, which immediately landed and occupied the place. This officer and his troops, after several varying orders, were finally sent up the Cumberland to Grant, and ordered forward by him to occupy Nashville and join Buell. It was a curious illustration of dramatic justice that the struggle of the generals over the capture of the place should end in the possession of Nashville by the troops of Buell under the orders of Grant, whose name had not once been mentioned by the contending commanders. For a few days succeeding the occupation of Nashville, news and rumors of what the rebels were doing were very conflicting, and none of the Union commanders suggested any definite campaign. On February 26, Halleck ordered preparations for a movement up either the Tennessee or the Cumberland, as events might require, but for two days he could not determine which. Finally, on the 1st of March, he sent distinct orders to Grant to command an expedition up the Tennessee River to destroy the railroad and cut the telegraph at Eastport, Corinth, Jackson, and Humboldt. This was to be not a permanent army advance, but a temporary raid by gunboats and troops on transports, all of which, after effecting what local destruction they could, were to return, the whole movement being merely auxiliary to the operations then in progress against New Madrid and Island Number 10, designed to hasten the fall of Columbus. It turned out that the preparations could not be made as quickly as Halleck had hoped, the delay arising not from the fault or neglect of any officer, but mainly from the prevailing and constantly increasing floods in the western waters, and especially from damage to telegraph lines that seriously hindered the prompt transmission of communications and orders. Out of this latter condition there also grew the episode of a serious misunderstanding between Halleck and Grant, which threatened to obscure the new and brilliant fame which the latter was earning. Only a moment of vexation and ill-temper can account for the harsh accusation Halleck sent to Washington, that Grant had left his post without leave, that he had failed to make reports, that he and his army were demoralized by the Donelson victory. Reply came back that generals must observe discipline as well as privates. Do not hesitate to arrest him, Grant, at once, added McClellan, if the good of the service requires it, and place C. F. Smith in command. 
Halleck immediately acted on the suggestion, ordered Grant to remain at Fort Henry, and gave the proposed Tennessee expedition to Smith. Grant obeyed, and at first explained, with an admirable control of temper, that he had not been in fault. Later on, however, feeling himself wronged, he several times asked to be relieved from duty. By this time Halleck was convinced that he had unjustly accused Grant, and as peremptorily declined to relieve him, and ordered him to resume his former general command. Instead of relieving you, he added, I wish you, as soon as your new army is in the field, to assume the immediate command and lead it on to new victories. In truth, while neither general had been unjust by intention, both had been blamable in conduct. Grant violated technical discipline in leaving his command without permission. Halleck, with undue haste, preferred an accusation which further information proved to be groundless. It is to the credit of both that they dismissed the incipient quarrel and with new zeal and generous confidence immediately joined in public service. While the Grant-Halleck controversy and preparations for the Tennessee River expedition were in progress, the military situation was day by day slowly defining itself, though as yet without very specific action or conclusion. Buell becoming satisfied that the enemy had no immediate intention to return and attack him at Nashville, inquired on March 3 of Halleck, what can I do to aid your operations against Columbus? To this Halleck replied on the 4th with the information that Columbus had been evacuated, and asked, Why not come to the Tennessee and operate with me to cut Johnston's line with Memphis, Randolph, and New Madrid? Without committing himself definitely, Buell answered on the 6th, merely proposing that they should meet at Louisville to discuss details. Halleck, however, unable to spare the time, held tenaciously to his proposition, informing Assistant Secretary Scott at Cairo of the situation in these words, I telegraphed to General Buell to reinforce me as strongly as possible at or near Savannah, Tennessee. Their line of defense is now an oblique one, extending from Island No. 10 to Decatur or Chattanooga. Having destroyed the railroads and bridges in his rear, Johnston cannot return to Nashville. We must again pierce his center at Savannah or Florence. Buell should move immediately and not come in too late as he did at Donelson. Feeling instinctively that he could get no effective voluntary help from Buell, Halleck turned again to McClellan, informing him of his intended expedition up the Tennessee River, that he had directed a landing to be made at Savannah, that he had sent entrenching tools and would push forward reinforcements as rapidly as possible. On the following day, however, reporting the strength of Grant's forces, he said, You will perceive from this that without Buell's aid I am too weak for operations on the Tennessee. The information received by him during the next twenty-four hours, that Curtis had won a splendid victory at the Battle of Pea Ridge in Arkansas, made a favorable change in his resources, and he explains his views and intentions to McClellan with more confidence. Reserves intended to support General Curtis will now be drawn in as rapidly as possible and sent to the Tennessee. I propose going there in a few days. That is now the great strategic line of the Western Campaign, and I am surprised that General Buell should hesitate to reinforce me. He was too late at Fort Donelson, as Hunter has been in Arkansas. I am obliged to make my calculations independent of both. Believe me, General, you make a serious mistake in having three independent commands in the West. There never will and never can be any cooperation at the critical moment. All military history proves it. You will regret your decision against me on this point. Your friendship for individuals has influenced your judgment. Be it so. I shall soon fight a great battle on the Tennessee, unsupported as it seems, but if successful it will settle the campaign in the West. We may also conclude that another element of the confidence that prompted his language was the intimation lately received from the Secretary of War, who three days before had asked him to state the limits of a military department that would place all the Western operations you deem expedient under your command. In fact, events in the East as well as in the West were culminating, which rather suddenly ended existing military conditions. The naval battle between the Merrimack and the Monitor, and the almost simultaneous evacuation of Manassas Junction by the rebel forces in Virginia, broke the long inactivity of the Army of the Potomac. We cannot better illustrate how intently Mr. Lincoln was watching Army operations, both in the East and the West, than by quoting his dispatch of March 10 to Buell. The evidence is very strong that the enemy in front of us here is breaking up and moving off. General McClellan is after him. Some part of the force may be destined to meet you. Look out and be prepared. I telegraphed Halleck, asking him to assist you if needed.
McClellan's aimless march to capture a few scarecrow sentinels and Quaker guns in the deserted rebel field works, which had been his nightmare for half a year, afforded the opportunity for a redistribution of military leaderships, which the winter's experience plainly dictated. Slow and cautious in maturing his decisions, President Lincoln was prompt to announce them when they were once reached. On the 11th of March, he issued his War Order No. 3, one of his most far-reaching acts of military authority. It relieved McClellan from the duties of General-in-Chief of all the armies, and sent him to the field charged with the single object of conducting the campaign against Richmond. This made possible a new combination for the West, and the same order united the three Western departments, as far east as Knoxville, Tennessee, under the command of Halleck. Under this arrangement was fought the great battle on the Tennessee that Halleck predicted, giving the Union armies a victory the decisive influence of which was felt throughout the remainder of the war, a success, however, due mainly to the gallantry of the troops and not to any genius or brilliant generalship of Halleck or his subordinate commanders. The Tennessee River expedition under Smith, which started on March 10, made good its landing at Savannah, and on the 14th Smith sent Sherman with a division on 19 steamboats preceded by gunboats to ascend the river towards Eastport and begin the work of destroying railroad communications, which had been the original object of the whole movement sherman made a landing to carry out his orders but this was the season of spring freshets a storm of rain and snow changed every ravine and rivulet to a torrent the tennessee river rose fifteen feet in twenty-four hours covering most steamboat landings with deep water and the intended raid by land and water was reduced to a mere river reconnaissance which proved the enemy to be in considerable force about iuka and corinth covering and guarding the important railroad crossings and communications. Sherman felt himself compelled to return to Pittsburgh Landing on the west bank of the Tennessee, nine miles above Savannah, which was on the east bank. The place was already well known to both armies, for a skirmish had occurred there on the 1st of March between Union gunboats and a rebel regiment. It would seem that General Smith had fixed upon Pittsburgh Landing as an available point from which to operate more at leisure upon the enemy's railroad communications, and hence had sent Hurlbut's division thither, which Sherman found there on his return. The place was not selected as a battlefield nor as a base of operations for a campaign, but merely to afford a temporary lodgment for raids upon the railroads. By a silent and gradual change of conditions, however, the intention and essential features of the whole Tennessee River movement underwent a transformation. What was begun as a provisional expedition became a strategic central campaign, and what was chosen for an outpost of detachments was almost imperceptibly turned into a principal point of concentration and became, by the unexpected assault of the enemy, one of the hardest-fought battlefields of the whole war. Halleck assumed command of his combined departments by general orders dated March 13, and after explaining once more to Buell that all his available force not required to defend Nashville should be sent up the Tennessee, he telegraphed him on the 16th of March, Move your forces by land to the Tennessee as rapidly as possible. Grant's army is concentrating at Savannah. You must direct your march on that point so that the enemy cannot get between us. The combined campaign thus set in motion was wise in conception, but its preliminary execution proved lamentably weak, and the blame is justly attributable in about equal measure to Halleck, Buell, and Grant. For a few days Halleck's orders were decided and firm, and then followed a slackening of opinion and a variance of direction that came near making a disastrous wreck of the whole enterprise his positive orders to buell to move as rapidly as possible and to concentrate at savannah were twice repeated on the seventeenth but on the twenty sixth he directed him to concentrate at savannah or eastport and on the twenty ninth to concentrate at savannah or pittsburgh while on april fifth he pointedly consented to a concentration at waynesboro this was inexcusable uncertainty in the combinations of a great strategist who complained that hesitation and delay are losing us the golden opportunity these were not the firm strides of a leader who promised to split secession in twain in one month it can hardly be claimed that buell's march fulfilled the injunction to move as rapidly as possible when his advanced division reached duck river at columbia on the eighteenth it found that stream swollen and the bridge destroyed and set itself to the task of building a new frame bridge with a deliberateness better befitting the leisure of peace than the pressing hurry of war buell arrived in person at columbia on the twenty sixth he manifested his own dissatisfaction with the delay by ordering the construction of another bridge, this time of pontoons, which was completed simultaneously with the first on March 30th. 
Still further delay was projected by a proposition to halt for concentration at Waynesboro. It must be said in justice to Buell that Halleck did not complain of the slow bridge building at Columbia, and that he consented to the concentration at Waynesboro. Had it taken place, Buell's army would again have been too late for a great battle. The excuse offered that Buell supposed the Union army to be safe on the east bank of the Tennessee at Savannah can scarcely be admitted, for on the 23rd Buell received a letter from Grant which said, I am massing troops at Pittsburgh, Tennessee. There is every reason to suppose that the rebels have a large force at Corinth, Mississippi, and at many other points on the road towards Decatur. The bridges over Duck River were finished on the 30th. Meanwhile, General William Nelson had obtained permission to ford the now falling stream with his division in order to have the advance and get the glory. Since Halleck's dispatches had by this time lost their tone of urgency and their definiteness of direction, Buell's army pursued its moderate march, Nelson's advance division reaching Savannah on the 5th of April and others on the 6th. It reflects no credit on General Halleck or General Grant that, during the interim of Buell's march, the advanced post of Pittsburgh Landing had been left in serious peril. Halleck was busy at St. Louis collecting reinforcements to send to Grant, with the announced intention to proceed to the field and take personal command on the Tennessee River. This implied a delay demanding either the concentration of the whole army at Savannah, as originally ordered by him, behind the safe barrier of the Tennessee, or strong fortifications for the exposed position of Pittsburgh Landing on the West Bank. On the other hand, Grant, resuming his general command in person on March 17, and finding his five divisions separated, three at Savannah and two at Pittsburgh Landing, nine miles apart with a river between them, properly took alarm and immediately united them. But in doing this, he committed the evident fault of defying danger by choosing the advanced position and of neglecting to raise the slightest entrenchments to protect his troops, which were without means of rapid retreat, against a possible assault from the enemy only twenty miles distant, and according to his own reports at all times his equal if not his superior in numbers. Indeed, in one of his dispatches he reports the numbers of the enemy at eighty thousand, a force at least double his own. But one cause can be assigned for this palpable imprudence. Well instructed in the duties of an officer under orders, he was just beginning his higher education as a leader of armies, and he was about to receive the most impressive lesson of his life. It has already been stated that after the fall of Fort Donelson, the rebel commanders fled southward in confusion and dismay. We have the high authority and calm judgment of General Grant in the mature experience and reflection of after years that, if one general who would have taken the responsibility had been in command of all the troops west of the Alleghanies, he could have marched to Chattanooga, Corinth, Memphis, and Vicksburg with the troops we then had. But the secessionists of the Southwest recovered rapidly from the stupefaction of unexpected disaster. In the delay of four or five weeks, that the divided ambition and overcautious hesitation of the Union generals afforded them, they had renewed their courage and united and reinforced their scattered armies. The separation of the armies of Johnston from those of Beauregard, which seemed irreparable when the Tennessee River was opened, had not been maintained by the prompt advance that everybody pointed out, but which nobody executed. By the 23rd of March, the two Confederate generals had, without opposition, effected a junction of their forces at and about Corinth, and thus reversed the pending military problem. In the last weeks of February, it could have been the United Unionists pursuing the divided Confederates. In the last weeks of March, it was the United Confederates preparing to attack the divided armies of Halleck and Buell. The whole situation and plan is summed up in the dispatch of General Albert Sidney Johnston to Jefferson Davis, dated April 3, 1862. General Buell is in motion, 30,000 strong, rapidly from Columbia by Clifton to Savannah, Mitchell behind him with 10,000. Confederate forces, 40,000, ordered forward to offer battle near Pittsburgh. Division from Bethel, main body from Corinth, reserve from Burnsville, converge tomorrow near Monterey on Pittsburgh. Beauregard, second in command, Polk, left. Hardy, center. Bragg, right wing. Breckinridge, reserve. Hope engagement before Buell can form junction. The Confederate march took place as projected, and on the evening of April 5th their joint forces went into bivouac two miles from the Union camps. That evening the Confederate commanders held an informal conference. Beauregard became impressed with impending defeat. Their march had been slow, the rations they carried were exhausted, and their extra rations and ammunition were not yet at hand. They could no longer hope to effect the complete surprise that was an essential feature of their plan. 
Beauregard advised a change of programme, to abandon the projected attack and convert the movement into a reconnaissance in force. General Johnston listened, but refused his assent, and orders were given to begin the battle next morning. No suspicion of such a march or attack entered the mind of any Union officer, and that same day Grant reported to Halleck, the main force of the enemy is at Corinth. The natural position occupied by the Union forces is admitted to have been unusually strong. The Tennessee River here runs nearly north. North of the camps, Snake Creek, with an affluent Owl Creek, formed a barrier stretching from the river bank in general direction towards the southwest. South of the camps, Lick Creek and River Sloughs also formed an impassable obstruction for a considerable distance next to the Tennessee. The river on the east, and Snake and Owl Creeks on the west, thus enclosed a high triangular plateau with sides three or four miles in length, crossed and intersected to some extent by smaller streams and ravines, though generally open towards the south. The roads from Pittsburgh Landing towards Corinth followed the main ridge, also towards the southwest. A network of other roads, very irregular in direction, ran from the Corinth roads to various points in the neighborhood. Alternate patches of timber, thick undergrowth, and open fields covered the locality. Over two miles in a straight line, or nearly three by the roads, southwest from Pittsburgh Landing, stood a log meeting house called Shiloh Church, which was destined to give its name to the conflict. Five of Grant's divisions were camped on this triangular plateau, not with any view of defense against an attack, but mainly with reference to convenience while there, and for a later movement upon Corinth. An advanced line about three miles long between Lick Creek and Owl Creek, if by courtesy we call it a line, was only partly occupied, and none of the regiments on this front had ever been under fire. Three brigades of Brigadier General W. T. Sherman's division filled, in a desultory way, the space from Owl Creek Bridge to a point some distance beyond Shiloh Church. South and eastward, near half a mile, rested the right of Brigadier General B. M. Prentice's division of seven regiments, entirely raw, only recently arrived, more recently armed, and one without ammunition. To the left and rear of this embryo division there was another large interval of nearly a mile where was Colonel David Stewart's brigade of three regiments. It belonged to Sherman's division, but had at the time of landing been thus located upon the Hamburg Road, two miles away from its division commander, to watch the fords in that quarter. At the time of the battle it formed the extreme left of the army. Between this line and Pittsburgh Landing were camped two other divisions, Major General John A. McClernand's from a half to three-quarters of a mile in the rear of the right center, and that of Brigadier General S. A. Hurlbut, about one mile in rear of the left center. In the rear of all these, and north of the road which ran due west from the landing, was Smith's division, then commanded by Brigadier General W. H. L. Wallace. In those divisions were many of the veterans of Belmont and Donelson, and they were the only ones upon the field who had stood the test of battle. Still another division, under General Lew Wallace, had been left at Crump's Landing six miles to the north as a guard against rebel raids, which threatened to gain possession of the banks of the Tennessee at that point to destroy the river communications. Grant had apprehensions of a raid of this character and cautioned his officers against it, causing such vigilance as had existed for several days. Most of the particulars of the battle that followed will probably always form a subject of dispute. There were no combined or dramatic movements of masses that can be analyzed and located. The Union Army had no prepared line of defense. Three lines in which the rebel army had been arranged for the attack quickly became broken and mingled with one another. On the Union side, the wide gaps between the camps, their irregular alignment, and the rapidity of the attack compelled the formation of whatever line of battle could be most hurriedly improvised by each separate corps or detachment. General Force says, A combat made up of numberless separate encounters of detached portions of broken lines, continually shifting position and changing direction in the forest and across ravines, filling an entire day, is almost incapable of a connected narrative. At five o'clock in the morning of Sunday, April 6, 1862, the rebel lines moved forward to the attack. The time required to pass the intervening two miles and the preliminary skirmishes with Union pickets and a reconnoitering Union regiment that began the fight gradually put the whole Union front on the alert, and when the main lines closed with each other, the divisions of Prentiss and Sherman were sufficiently in position to offer a stubborn resistance, and thus enabled reinforcements to come to their support from the other divisions. The Confederates found themselves foiled in the easy surprise and confusion that they had counted upon. 
It would be a tedious waste of time to attempt to follow the details of the fight which, begun before sunrise, continued till near sunset. Along the labyrinth of local roads, over the mixed patchwork of woods, open fields, and almost impenetrable thickets, across stretches of level, broken by miry hollows and abrupt ravines, the swinging lines of conflict moved intermittently throughout the entire day. There was onset and repulse, yell of assault and cheer of defiance, screeching of shells and sputtering of volleys, advance and retreat but steadily through the fluctuating changes the general progress was northward the rebels gaining and pushing their advance the unionists stubbornly resisting but little by little losing ground it was like the flux and reflux of ocean breakers dashing themselves with tireless repetition against a yielding crumbling shore beauregard to whom the confederate commander on going to the front had committed the duties of general headquarters advanced with the general staff to shiloh church near which stood general sherman's headquarters tent the time consumed and the lists of dead and wounded are sufficient evidence of the brave conduct of officers and the gallant courage of men on both sides on the union side the divisions of hurlbut and w h l wallace had early been brought forward to sustain those of sherman mcclernand and prentice it was to a degree seldom witnessed in a battle the slow and sustained struggle through an entire day of one whole army against another whole army the five union divisions engaged in the battle of sunday numbered thirty three thousand the total force of the confederates attacking them was forty thousand it was in the afternoon that the more noteworthy incidents of the contest took place the first of these was the death of the confederate commander general albert sidney johnston who fell in front of hurlbut between two and three o'clock while personally leading the charge of a brigade the knowledge of the loss was carefully kept from the confederate army and the headquarters management on their side of the conflict was not therefore impaired because beauregard had been mainly entrusted with it from the beginning it has been mentioned that stuart's brigade of three regiments was posted at the extreme left of the union front and although its right regiment quickly became demoralized and disappeared the remaining two not being as yet hard pressed had with some change of position towards the rear held their place till about noon from that time until two o'clock they bravely maintained their ground against sharp attacks from superior forces after severe loss they were also driven back but their gallant resistance materially retarded the enemy's advance next to the tennessee river about five o'clock in the afternoon a serious loss fell upon the unionists general prentice commanding the sixth division and general w h l wallace commanding the second division whose united lines had held one of the key points of the federal left centre against numerous and well concentrated assaults of the enemy found that the withdrawal of troops both on the right and the left produced gaps that offered openings to the enemy prentice had been instructed by general grant to hold his position at all hazards and consulting with wallace they determined to obey the order notwithstanding the now dangerous exposure but the enemy seizing the advantage they quickly found themselves enveloped and surrounded only portions of their command succeeding in cutting their way out wallace was mortally wounded and prentice and fragments of the two divisions numbering twenty two hundred men were taken prisoner this wholesale capture left a wide opening in the left of the federal lines and probably would have given the victory to the rebels but for another circumstance which somewhat compensated for so abrupt a diminution of the union forces the union lines had now been swept back more than a mile and a half and the rebel attack was approaching the main road running from pittsburgh landing along the principal ridge which here lay nearly at a right angle to the river colonel j d webster of general grant's staff noting the steady retreat of the union lines and foreseeing that the advancing attack of the enemy would eventually reach this ridge busied himself to post a line of artillery from thirty-five to fifty guns along the crest gathering whatever was available among which were several siege pieces to man and support this extemporized battery he organized and posted in conjunction with hurlbut's division such fragments of troops as had become useless at the front to reach the crest of this ridge and this line of hastily planted cannon the enemy was obliged to cross a deep broad hollow extending to the river and partly filled with backwater the topography of the place was such that the gunboats tyler and lexington were also stationed in the tennessee abreast the valley and sheet of backwater and their guns were thus enabled to assist the line of cannon on the ridge by a cross-fire of shells general grant had passed the night of april fifth at savannah where he had become aware of the arrival of the advance brigades of nelson's division of buell's army on that same day he started by boat to pittsburg landing early sunday morning april sixth having heard the firing but not regarding it as an attack in force 
Arrived there, he became a witness of the serious nature of the attack, and remained on the battle field, visiting the various division commanders and giving such orders as the broken and fluctuating course of the conflict suggested. But the defense, begun in uncertainty and haste before his arrival, could not thereafter be reduced to any order or system. It necessarily, all day long, merely followed the changes and the violence of the rebel attack. The blind and intricate battlefield offered little chance for careful planning. The haste and tumult of combat left no time for tactics. On neither side could the guidance of general command render the usual service. It was the division, brigade, and regimental commanders who fought the battle. About noon of Sunday, General Grant began to have misgivings of the result, and dispatched a letter for help to Buell's forces at Savannah, saying, If you will get upon the field, leaving all your baggage on the east bank of the river, it will be a move to our advantage, and possibly save the day to us. He also sent an order to General Lew Wallace at Crump's Landing to hasten his division to the right of the army. So far as the Confederates had any distinct plan of battle, it was merely the simple one of forcing the Federals away from the river to gain possession of Pittsburgh Landing, cut off their means of retreat by seizing or destroying the transports, and compel Grant to capitulate. But the execution of this leading design was completely frustrated by the difficult nature of the ground and the gallant resistance of the Federal left. The principal advance made by the rebels was not next to the river where they desired it, but on the Union right next to Owl Creek where it was of least value. Even after they had captured the whole residue of Prentice's and Wallace's divisions and had cleared out that terrible center of the Union fire which they had ineffectually assaulted a dozen times and which by bitter experience they themselves learned to know and designate as the hornet's nest and near which their commander had fallen in death, they were not yet within the reach of the coveted banks of Pittsburgh Landing. Before them was still a line of steep hills separated from them by the broad valley and backwater, the mire across which screeched the shells from the gunboats and from the long death-threatening line of Webster's Reserve artillery, behind which the bayonets of Hurlbut's division, yet solid in organization and strong in numbers, glinted in the evening sun. From Hurlbut's right the shattered but courageous remnants of the divisions of McClernand and Sherman stretched away in an unbroken line towards Owl Creek. Ground had been lost and ground had been won. The line of fire had moved a mile and a half to the north. The lines of combatants had been shortened from three miles in the morning to one mile in the evening. But now, after the day's conflict, when the sun approached its setting, the relations and the prospects of the bloody fight were but little changed. The Confederates held the field of battle, but the Unionists held their central position, their supplies, and their communications. The front of attack had become as weak as the front of defense. On each side, from eight to ten thousand men had been lost by death, wounds, and capture. From ten to fifteen thousand panic-stricken Union stragglers cowered under the shelter of the high river bank at Pittsburgh Landing. From ten to fifteen thousand Confederate stragglers, some equally panic-stricken, others demoralized by the irresistible temptations of camp pillage, encumbered the rear of Beauregard's army. The day was nearly gone, and the battle was undecided. A controversy has recently arisen as to the personal impressions and intentions of General Grant at this crisis. His memoirs declare in substance that he was still so confident of victory that he gave orders that evening for a renewal of the fight on the following morning by a general attack. General Buell, on the other hand, makes a strong argument that the evidence is against this assumption. It is possible, as in so many other cases, that the truth lies midway between the two statements. A famous newspaper correspondent who was on the battlefield made the following record of the affair long before this controversy arose. The tremendous roar to the left, momentarily nearer and nearer, told of an effort to cut him off from the river and from retreat. Grant sat his horse, quiet, thoughtful, almost stolid. Said one to him, Does not the prospect begin to look gloomy? Not at all, was the quiet reply. They can't force our lines around these batteries tonight. It is too late. Delay counts everything with us. Tomorrow we shall attack them with fresh troops and drive them, of course. The correspondent adds in a note, I was myself a listener to this conversation, and from it I date, in my own case at least, the beginning of any belief in Grant's greatness. As the writer was one of Grant's most candid critics, his testimony on this point is all the more valuable. The turning point was at length reached. Whatever may have been the much disputed intentions and hopes of commanders at that critical juncture that were not expressed and recorded, or what might have been the possibilities and consequence of acts that were not attempted, it is worse than useless to discuss upon hypothesis. 
Each reader for himself must interpret the significance of the three closing incidents of that momentous Sunday, which occurred almost simultaneously. Some of the rebel division commanders, believing that victory would be insured by one more desperate assault against the Union left to gain possession of Pittsburg Landing, made arrangements and gave orders for that object. It seems uncertain, however, whether the force could have been gathered and the movement made in any event. Only a single brigade made the attempt, and it was driven back in confusion. The officer of another detachment refused the desperate service. Still others were overtaken in their preparation by orders from General Beauregard to withdraw the whole Confederate army away from the fight, and to go into bivouac until the following day. Eager as was that commander for victory, the conclusion had been forced on his mind that, for that day at least, it was not within the power of his army to complete their undertaking, and accordingly he directed that the fight should cease. He reached this determination not knowing that Buell had arrived, and still hoping that he would not arrive even on the morrow in this hope beauregard was disappointed while yet his orders to retire from the combat were being executed and before the last desperate charge of the rebels towards webster's reserve artillery was beaten back the vanguard of nelson's division which had marched from savannah and had been ferried across the river by transports was mounting the bank at pittsburg landing and deploying in line of battle under the enemy's fire colonel jacob ammon's fresh brigade first coming to the support of the line of union guns a few men out of the brigade fell by the rebel bullets and then came twilight and soon after the darkness of night the tide of victory was effectually turned whatever the single army of grant might or might not have accomplished on the following day against the army of beauregard is only speculation beauregard's attack had been ordered discontinued before the actual presence of buell's troops on the battlefield had the attack been continued however that opportune arrival would have rendered its success impossible after sunset of sunday all chances of a rebel victory vanished the remainder of nelson's division immediately crossed the river and followed ammon's brigade to the field brigadier-general t l crittenden's division was next placed in position during the night finally brigadier-general a mcd mccook's division reached pittsburgh landing early monday morning and promptly advanced to the front general buell who had come before the vanguard on sunday in person directed the placing and preparation of these three superb divisions of his army a total of about twenty thousand fresh well equipped and well drilled troops to renew an offensive conflict along the left of the federal line on the federal right was stationed the fresh division of general lew wallace numbering five thousand which had arrived from crump's landing a little after nightfall and which took position soon after midnight on sunday Along the Federal right center, Grant's reduced divisions which had fought the Battle of Sunday were gathered and reorganized, McClernand and Sherman in front, Hurlbut and remnants of W. H. L. Wallace's division with some new detachments in reserve. Grant and Buell met on Sunday evening and agreed to take the offensive jointly on Monday morning, Buell to command his three divisions on the left, Grant to direct his own forces on the right. No special plan was adopted other than simultaneously to drive the enemy from the field the plan was carried out in harmony and with entire success with only temporary checks brought about by the too great impetuosity of the newly arrived reinforcements the two wings of the union army advanced steadily and by three o'clock in the afternoon were in possession of all the ground from which they had been driven on the previous day while the rebel army was in full retreat upon corinth foiled of its victory dejected in spirit and in a broken and almost hopeless state of disorganization a little more genius and daring on the part of the union commanders would have enabled them by vigorous pursuit to demolish or capture it but they chose the more prudent alternative and remained satisfied with only sufficient advance to assure themselves that the enemy had disappeared the statement of the union losses at the battle of shiloh which has been compiled from official records is as follows in the army of grant one thousand five hundred thirteen killed six thousand six hundred one wounded and two thousand eight hundred thirty captured or missing in the army of buell two hundred forty one killed eighteen hundred seven wounded and fifty five captured or missing the confederate loss is stated to have been one thousand seven hundred twenty eight killed eight thousand twelve wounded and nine hundred fifty nine missing end of chapter eighteen recording by denise nordell modesto california Chapter 19 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5, by John Hay and John George Nicolay, Chapter 19. Halleck's Corinth Campaign. On Wednesday, April 9th, two days after the Battle of Shiloh, General Grant gave evidence that he had fully learned the severe lesson of that terrible encounter. Reporting to Halleck his information that the enemy was again concentrating all his forces at Corinth, he added, I do not like to suggest, but it appears to me that it would be demoralizing upon our troops here to be forced to retire upon the opposite bank of the river, and unsafe to remain on this many weeks without large reinforcements. Halleck's opinion probably coincided with that of Grant and the fortunes of war enabled him immediately to fulfill his promise to come to his relief. The day which saw the conclusion of the fight at Shiloh, April 7, 1862, witnessed the surrender of the rebel works at Island No. 10 on the Mississippi River and the quick capture of nearly their entire garrison of 6,000 or 7,000 men. This finished the task which General Pope had been sent to do, and enabled Halleck to transfer him and his army by water from the Mississippi River to the Tennessee. Halleck's order was made on April 15th, and on the 22nd, Pope landed at Hamburg, four miles above the battlefield of Shiloh, with his compact force of 20,000 men fully organized and equipped, and flushed with a signal victory. Halleck had arrived before him. Reaching Pittsburgh Landing on the 11th of April, he began with industry to cure the disorders produced by the recent battle. Critics who still accuse the Lincoln administration of ignorant meddling with military affairs are invited to remember the language of the Secretary of War to Halleck on this occasion. I have no instructions to give you. Go ahead, and all success attend you. The arrival of Pope was utilized by Halleck to give his united command an easy and immediate organization into Army Corps. His special field orders of April 28th named the Army of the Tennessee the 1st Army Corps, commanded by Grant, and constituting the right wing the Army of the Ohio, the Second Army Corps, commanded by Buell, and constituting the center, and the newly arrived Army of the Mississippi, the Third Army Corps, commanded by Pope, and forming the left wing. Two days later, April 30th, another order gave command of the right wing to General Thomas, whose division of the Army of the Ohio was added to it. It also organized a reserve corps under General McClernand, and had this provision. Major General Grant will retain the general command of the District of West Tennessee, including the Army Corps of the Tennessee, and reports will be made to him as heretofore. But in the present movements, he will act as second in command under the Major General commanding the department. The exact intent of this assignment remains to this day a matter of doubt. Nominally, it advanced Grant in rank and authority. Practically, it deprived him of active and important duty. Halleck, being on the field in person, issued his orders directly to the corps commanders and received reports from them, and for about two months Grant found himself without serious occupation. The position became so irksome that he several times asked to be relieved, but Halleck refused, though he finally allowed him to go for a season into a species of honorable retirement by removing his headquarters from the camp of the main army. Coming to the front so soon after the great battle, Halleck seems to have been impressed with the seriousness of the conflict, for all his preparations to assume the offensive were made with the most deliberate caution. It was manifest that the enemy intended to defend Corinth, and necessarily that place became his first objective. With all the efforts that the Confederate government could make, however, Beauregard succeeded in bringing together only about 50,000 effective troops. Halleck's combined armies contained more than double that number, but such was his fear of another surprise, or a sudden disaster, that his advance upon Corinth was not like an invading march, but like the investment of a fortress. An army carrying 100,000 bayonets, in the picturesque language of General Sherman, moved upon Corinth with pick and shovel. Entrenching, bridge-building, road-making were the order of the day. Former carelessness and temerity were succeeded by a fettering over-caution. The administration expected more energetic campaigning from a commander of Halleck's reputed skill and the brilliant results realized since his advent. The country seemed at the culmination of great events. Since the beginning of the year, success had smiled almost continuously upon the Union cause. 
as the crowning inspiration in the midst of his march there had come the joyful news of farragut's triumph and the capture of new orleans troops cannot be detached from here on the eve of a great battle telegraphed halleck to stanton we are now at the enemy's throat to such encouraging assurances the administration responded with every possible exertion of reinforcement and supply but days succeeded days and the president's hope remained deferred nearly a month later when reports came that halleck was awaiting the arrival of a fourth union army that of curtis from arkansas and these reports were supplemented by intimations that he would like to be joined by a fifth army from somewhere else Mr. Lincoln sent him a letter of such kindly explanation that, in the actual condition of things, every word was a stinging rebuke. Several dispatches from Assistant Secretary Scott and one from Governor Morton asking reinforcements for you have been received. I beg you to be assured we do the best we can. I mean to cast no blame when I tell you each of our commanders along our line from Richmond to Corinth supposes himself to be confronted by numbers superior to his own. Under this pressure, we thin the line on the Upper Potomac. Until yesterday, it was broken at heavy loss to us, and General Banks put in great peril, out of which he is not yet extricated and may be actually captured. We need men to repair this breach, and of them not at hand." My dear General, I feel justified to rely very much on you. I believe you and the brave officers and men with you can and will get the victory at Corinth. In reply, Halleck resorted to the usual expedient of reading the Secretary of War a military lecture. May 25th he wrote, Permit me to remark that we are operating upon too many points. Richmond and Corinth are now the great strategical points of war, and our success at these points should be ensured at all hazards. His Herculean effort expended itself without corresponding result when, a week later, he marched into the empty entrenchments of Corinth, only to find that the 50,000 men composing Beauregard's army, the vital strength of rebellion in the West, were retreating at leisure to Baldwin and Okolona, railroad town some 50 miles to the south. It had required but two days for the rebel army to go from Corinth to the Shiloh battlefield. Halleck consumed 37 days to pass over the same distance and the same ground, with an army twice as strong as that of his adversary. Pope had reached him April 22nd, and it was the 29th of May when the Union army was within assaulting distance of the rebel entrenchments. The campaign had advanced with scientific precision and attained one object for which it was conducted. It gained the fortifications of Corinth. In the end, however, it proved to be but the shell of the expected victory. Beauregard had not only skillfully disputed the advance and deceived his antagonist, but at the critical moment had successfully withdrawn the rebel forces to wage more equal conflict on other fields. The enemy evacuated Corinth on the night of the 29th, and beyond the usual demoralization which attends such a retrograde movement, suffered little, for Halleck ordered only pursuit enough to drive him to a convenient distance. The achievement was the triumph of a strategist, not the success of a general. Instead of seizing his opportunity to win a great battle or to capture an army by siege, he had simply maneuvered the enemy out of position. In reporting his success to Washington, Halleck, of course, magnified its value to the utmost. And for the moment, the administration, not having that full information which afterwards so seriously diminished the estimate, accepted the report in good faith as a grand Union triumph. It was, indeed, a considerable measure of success. Besides its valuable moral effort in strengthening the patriotism and confidence of the North, and the secondary military advantage that the combined Western armies gained in the two months' strict camp discipline and active practical instruction in the art of field fortification, there was the positive possession of an important railroad center, and the apparent security of western and central Tennessee from rebel occupation. In addition to these, it had one yet more immediate and valuable military result. The remaining rebel strongholds on the upper Mississippi were now so completely turned that they were no longer tenable. Forts Pillow and Randolph were hastily evacuated by the enemy, and the Union flotilla took possession of their deserted works on June 5th. Halleck had been looking somewhat anxiously for help on the river, 
and had complained of the unwillingness of the gunboats to run past the Fort Pillow batteries and destroy the river fleet of the rebels. Flag Officer Davis had considered the risk too great and had remained above Fort Pillow, occupying his time and harassing the works by a continuous bombardment. Now that the way was opened, he immediately advanced in force and at night of June 5th came to anchor two miles above the city of Memphis. His flotilla had lately received a notable reinforcement. One of the many energetic impulses which Stanton gave to military operations in the first few months after he became Secretary of War was his employment of an engineer of genius and daring, Charles Ellett, Jr., to extemporize a fleet of steam rams for service on the western rivers. The single blow by which the iron prow of the Merrimack sunk the Cumberland at the time of the famous sea fight between the Merrimack and the Monitor had demonstrated the effectiveness of this novelty in marine warfare. Ellett's proposal to the Secretary of the Navy to try it on the western rivers was not favorably entertained, probably because the Navy Department already had its officers and its appropriations engaged in other more methodical and permanent naval constructions. But the eager and impatient Secretary of War listened to Ellett's plans with interest, and commissioned him to collect such suitable river craft as he could find on the Ohio, and to convert them post-haste into steam rams. The Honorable Secretary, reports Ellett, expressing the hope that not more than twenty days would be consumed in getting them ready for service. Ellett received his orders March 27th. On May 25th, he joined the flotilla of Davis with a fleet of six vessels, formerly swift and strong river tugs and steamers, but now strengthened and converted for their new and peculiar service, and these accompanied the gunboats in the advance against Memphis. On the morning of June 6th, the rebel flotilla of eight gunboats was discovered in front of the city preparing for fight, and there occurred another of the many dramatic naval combats of the war. The eight rebel gunboats ranged themselves in two lines abreast the city. The hills of Memphis were covered with thousands of spectators. With the dawn, five of the Union gunboats began backing down the Mississippi, holding their heads against the strong current to ensure easier control and management of the vessels. The steam rams were yet tied up to the river bank. Soon the rebel flotilla opened fire on the Union gunboats, to which the latter replied with spirit. Four of Ellet's rams, hearing the guns, cast loose to take part in the conflict. One of them disabled her rudder, and another, mistaking her orders, remained out of the fighting distance. But the Queen of the West and the Monarch, passing swiftly between the gunboats, dashed into the rebel line. The gunboats, now turning their heads down the stream, hastily followed. There was a short and quick melee of these uncouth-looking river monsters, ram crashing into ram and gunboat firing into gunboat in a confusion of attack and destruction. In twenty minutes, four rebel vessels and one Union ram were sunk or disabled. At this, the other four rebel vessels turned and fled downstream, and in a running pursuit of an hour extending some ten miles, three additional vessels of the enemy were captured or destroyed. The Confederate fleet was almost annihilated. Only one of the gunboats escaped. The two disabled Union ships were soon raised and repaired, but the ram fleet had suffered an irreparable loss. Its commander, Ellet, was wounded by a pistol shot, from the effect of which he died two weeks later. The combat was witnessed by Jeff Thompson, commanding the city with a small detachment of rebel troops. In his report of the affair, he mentions that we were hurried in our retirement from Memphis. That afternoon, the Union flag floated over the city. The naval victory of Memphis supplemented and completed the great Tennessee campaign begun by Grant's reconnaissance of January 9th. A division of Buell's army under General Mitchell had in the meanwhile occupied and held the line of the Tennessee River between Tuscumbia and Stevenson, and thus the frontier of rebellion had been pushed down from middle Kentucky below the southern boundary of the state of Tennessee. But the invading movement following the line of the Tennessee River had expended its advantage. The initial point of a new campaign had been reached. We are left in doubt under what conviction Halleck formed his next plans, for he determined to dissolve and scatter the magnificent army of more than 100,000 men under his hand and eye, apparently in violation of the very military theory he had formulated two weeks before when he said, We are operating on too many points. In a dispatch to the Secretary of War on the 9th of June, he announced his purpose to do three distinct things. 
first to hold the memphis and charleston railroad second to send relief to curtis in arkansas third to send troops to east tennessee to these three he added a fourth purpose in a dispatch of june twelfth if the combined fleet of farragut and davis fail to take vicksburg i will send an expedition for that purpose as soon as i can reinforce general curtis up to this point the country's estimate of general halleck's military ability had steadily risen but several serious errors of judgment now arrested his success the greatest of these errors perhaps was the minor importance he seems to have attached to a continuation of the operations on the mississippi river we have described the victory of farragut and we need now to follow the upward course of his fleet after receiving the surrender of new orleans in the last days of april he promptly pushed an advance section of his ships up the mississippi which successfully and without serious opposition received the surrender of all the important cities below vicksburg where farragut himself arrived on the twentieth of may vicksburg proved to be the most defensible position on the mississippi by reason of the high bluffs at and about the city the confederates had placed such faith in their defenses of the upper river at columbus island number ten and fort pillow that no early steps were taken to fortify vicksburg but when farragut passed and captured the lower forts and the upper defenses fell the rebels made what haste they could to create a formidable barrier to navigation at vicksburg beauregard sent plans for fortifications while he was yet disputing halleck's advance from shiloh to corinth and lovell at new orleans retreating before farragut's invasion shipped the heavy guns he could no longer keep and sent five regiments of confederate troops which he could no longer use to erect the works these reached their destination on may twelfth and continuing the labors and preparations already begun he had six batteries ready for service on farragut's arrival remembering these dates and numbers we can realize the unfortunate results of halleck's dilatory corinth campaign he had then been in command for a whole month of forces double those of his antagonist if instead of digging his way from shiloh to corinth with pick and shovel he had forced such a prompt march and battle as his overwhelming numbers gave him power to do the inevitable defeat or retreat of his enemy would have enabled him to meet the advance of farragut with an army detachment sufficient to effect the reduction of vicksburg with only slight resistance and delay such a movement ought to have followed by all the rules of military and political logic the opening of the Mississippi outranked every other Western military enterprise in importance and urgency. It would have effectively severed four great states from the rebel Confederacy. It would have silenced doubt at home and extinguished smoldering intervention abroad. It would have starved the rebel armies and fed the cotton operatives of Europe. There would have been ample time, for he was advised as early as the 27th of April, that New Orleans had been captured and that Farragut had orders to push up to Memphis immediately and he ought to have prepared to meet them no such cooperation however greeted farragut reaching vicksburg his demand for the surrender of the place was refused the batteries were at such a height that his guns could have no effect against them only two regiments of land forces accompanied the fleet there was nothing to be done but return to new orleans which he had reached about the first of june here he met orders from washington communicating the great desire of the administration to have the river opened Farragut took immediate measures to comply with this requirement. But his task had already become more difficult. The enemy quickly comprehended the advantage which the few high bluffs of the Mississippi afforded them, if not to obstruct, at least to harass and damage the operations of a fleet unsupported by land forces. The places which had been surrendered were, on the retirement of the ships, again occupied, and batteries were soon raised, which, though unable to cope with armed vessels, became troublesome and dangerous to transports and were intermittently used or abandoned as the advantage or necessity of the enemy dictated farragut again reached vicksburg about june twenty fifth accompanied this time by porter with sixteen of his mortar boats and by general thomas williams at the head of three thousand union troops the mortar sloops were placed in position and bombarded the rebels works on the twenty seventh on the morning of june twenty eighth before daylight farragut's ships with the aid of the continued bombardment made an attack on the vicksburg batteries and most of them succeeded in passing up the river with comparatively small loss here he found ellet a brother of him who was wounded at memphis with some vessels of the ram fleet who carried the news to the gunboat flotilla under davis yet at memphis this flotilla 
now also descended the river and joined Farragut on the 1st of July. We have seen, by the dispatch heretofore quoted, that Halleck expected the combined naval and gunboat forces to reduce the Vicksburg defenses, but also that, in the event of their failure, he would send an army to help them. The lapse of two weeks served to modify this intention. The Secretary of War, who had probably received news of Farragut's first failure to pass the Vicksburg batteries, telegraphed him on June 23rd to examine the project of a canal to cut off Vicksburg, suggested by General Butler and others. Halleck replied, on June 28th, It is impossible to send forces to Vicksburg at present, but I will give the matter very full attention as soon as circumstances will permit. That same day Farragut passed above the batteries, and of this result Halleck was informed by Grant, who was at Memphis. Grant's dispatch added an erroneous item of news concerning the number of troops with Farragut, uh, but more trustworthy information soon reached Halleck in the form of a direct application from Farragut for help. To this appeal, Halleck again felt himself obliged to reply in the negative, June 3rd, 1862. The scattered and weakened condition of my forces renders it impossible for me at the present to detach any troops to cooperate with you on Vicksburg. Probably I shall be able to do so as soon as I can get my troops more concentrated. This may delay the clearing of the river, but its accomplishment will be certain in a few weeks. The hopeful promise with which the telegram closed dwindled away during the eleven days that followed. On the 14th of July, Stanton asked him the direct question, the Secretary of the Navy desires to know whether you have, or intend to have, any land force to cooperate in the operations at Vicksburg. Please inform me immediately, inasmuch as orders he intends to give will depend on your answer. The answer this time was short and conclusive. I cannot at present give Commodore Farragut any aid against Vicksburg. A cooperative land force of from 12,000 to 15,000 men, Farragut estimated in his report of June 28th, would have been sufficient to take the works. If we compare the great end to be attained with the smallness of the detachment thought necessary, there remains no reasonable explanation why Halleck should not have promptly sent it. But the chance had been lost. The waters of the Mississippi were falling so rapidly that Farragut dared not tarry in the river and in accordance with orders received from the department on July 20th, he again ran past the Vicksburg batteries and returned to New Orleans. If Halleck's refusal to help Farragut take Vicksburg seems inexplicable, it is yet more difficult to understand the apparently sudden cessation of all his military activity, and his proposal, just at the time when his army had gathered its greatest strength and efficiency, to terminate his main campaign, and in effect go into summer quarters. He no longer talked of splitting secession in Twain in one month, or of being at the enemy's throat. He no longer pointed out the waste of precious time, and uttered no further complaint about his inability to control Buell's army. His desires had been gratified. He commanded half of the military area within the Union. He had three armies under his own eye. The enemy was in flight before him. He could throw double numbers of men at any given point. At least two campaigns of overshadowing importance invited his resistless march. But in the midst of his success, in the plentitude of his power, with fortune thrusting opportunity upon him, he came to a sudden halt, folded his contented arms, and imitated the conduct that he wrongfully imputed to Grant after Donelson. Satisfied with his victory, he sits down and enjoys it without regard to the future. In a long letter to the Secretary of War, dated June 25th, after reviewing the sanitary condition of the Army and pronouncing it very good, he asked, apparently as the main question, can we carry on any summer campaign without having a large portion of our men on the sick list? This idea seemed to dominate his thought and to decide his action. Buell had been ordered eastward on a leisurely march toward Chattanooga. Halleck proposed to plant the armies of Grant and of Pope on the healthy uplands of northern Mississippi and Alabama as mere corps of observation. Having personally wrested Corinth from the enemy, he exaggerated its strategic value. As a terminal point in the southward campaign along the line of the Tennessee River, its chief use was to aid in opening the Mississippi River by turning the Confederate fortifications from Columbus to Memphis. Those strongholds, once in federal possession, Corinth inevitably fell into a secondary role. 
especially since the summer droughts rendered the Tennessee River useless as a military highway. Carrying out this policy of Halleck, a large portion of the Western armies of the Union wasted time and strength guarding a great area of rebel territory unimportant for military uses, and which could have been better protected by an active forward movement. The security and the supply of Corinth appears to have been the central purpose. Buell was delayed in his march thoroughly to repair the railroad from Corinth eastward towards Chattanooga. Other detachments of the army were employed to repair the railroads westward from Corinth to Memphis, and northward from Corinth to Columbus. For several months, all the energies of the combined armies were diverted from their more useful duty of offensive war to tedious labor on these local railroads. Much of the repair is being destroyed, almost as rapidly as performed, by daring guerrilla hostilities, engendered and screened amidst the surrounding sentiment of disloyalty. It is impossible to guess what Halleck's personal supervision in these tasks might have produced, for at this juncture came a culmination of events that transferred him to another field of duty. But the legacy of policy, plans, and orders that he left behind contributed to render the whole Western campaign sterile throughout the second half of 1862. The unfortunate policy of thus tying up the Western forces in mere defensive inaction comes out in still stronger light in the incident that follows but it especially serves to show once more how, in the West as well as in the East, President Lincoln treated his military commanders, not with ignorant interference, as has been so often alleged, but with the most fatherly indulgence. Future chapters will describe the complete failure in the East of the campaign undertaken by McClellan against Richmond, and which, on the 30th of June, brought to Halleck an order from the Secretary of War, dated the 28th, immediately to detach and send 25,000 men to assist that imperiled enterprise. The necessity was declared imperative. But in detaching your force, explained the order, the president directs that it be done in such way as to enable you to hold your ground and not interfere with the movement against Chattanooga and East Tennessee. Halleck took instant measures to obey the order, but said in reply that it would jeopardize the ground gained in Tennessee and involved the necessity of abandoning Buell's East Tennessee expedition. This result the president had in advance declared inadmissible. He now telegraphed emphatically on June 30th, would be very glad of 25,000 infantry, no artillery or cavalry, but please do not send a man if it endangers any place you deem important to hold, or if it forces you to give up or weaken or delay the expedition against Chattanooga to take and hold the railroad at or east of Cleveland and East Tennessee, I think fully as important as the taking and holding of Richmond. This request, but accompanied by the same caution and condition, was repeated by the President on July 2nd. And again, under the prompting of extreme need, Lincoln on July 4th sent a diminished request, still, however, insisting that no risk be incurred in the West. You do not know how much you would oblige us if, without abandoning any of your positions or plans, you could promptly send us even 10,000 infantry. Can you not? Some part of the Corinth army is certainly fighting McClellan in front of Richmond. Prisoners are in our hands from the late Corinth army. In Halleck's response on the following day, it is important to notice the difference in the opinions entertained by the two men upon this point. Lincoln wished to gain East Tennessee. Halleck desired to hold West Tennessee. The distinction is essential, for we shall see that while Halleck's policy prevailed, it tended largely, if not principally, to thwart the realization of Lincoln's earnest wish. Halleck telegraphed, For the last week there has been great uneasiness among Union men in Tennessee on account of the secret organizations of insurgents to cooperate in any attack of the enemy on our lines. Every commanding officer from Nashville to Memphis has asked for reinforcements. Under these circumstances, I submitted the question of sending troops to Richmond to the principal officers of my command. They are unanimous in the opinion that if this army is seriously diminished, the Chattanooga expedition must be revoked or the hope of holding southwest Tennessee abandoned. I must earnestly protest against surrendering what has cost us so much blood and treasure, and which in a military point of view, is worth three Richmonds. He had already, in a previous telegram, July 1st, 
acknowledged and exercised the discretion which Lincoln gave him, replying, Your telegram just received saves western Tennessee. It was found by the Washington authorities that the early reports of McClellan's reverses had been unduly exaggerated, and that by straining resources in the east the western armies might be left undiminished. But with this conviction, President Lincoln also reached the decision that the failure of the Richmond campaign must be remedied by radical measures. To devise new plans to elaborate and initiate new movements, he needed the help of the highest attainable professional skill. None seemed at the moment so available as that of Halleck. Under his administration, order had come out of chaos in Missouri and under his guiding control, however feeble in the particular cases that we have pointed out, the Western armies had won the victories of Fort Henry, Fort Donelson, Pea Ridge, Shiloh, Island No. 10, and Corinth. It was a record of steady success, which justified the belief that a general had been found who might be entrusted with the direction of the war in its larger combinations. The weakness of his present plans had not yet been developed. Accordingly, on the 11th of July, this order was made by the President. That Major General Henry W. Halleck be assigned to command the whole land forces of the United States as General-in-Chief, and that he repair to this capital as soon as he can with safety to the positions and operations within the department under his charge. It seemed at the moment the best that could be done. In his short Corinth campaign, Halleck had substantially demonstrated his unfitness for the leadership of an army in the field. He had made a grievous mistake in coming away from his department headquarters at St. Louis. He was a thinker and not a worker. His proper place was in the military study and not in the camp. No other soldier in active service equaled him in the technical and theoretical acquirements of his profession. The act of the president in bringing him to Washington restored him to his more natural duty. In following the further career of Halleck, one of the incidents attending this transfer needs to be borne in mind. The first intimation of the change came in the president's dispatch of the 2nd of July, which asked, Please tell me, could you make me a flying visit for consultation without endangering the service in your department? A few days later, one of the president's friends went from Washington to Corinth, bearing a letter of introduction to Halleck, explaining, among other things, I know the object of his visit to you. He has my cheerful consent to go, but not my direction. He wishes to get you and part of your force, one or both, to come here. You already know I should be exceedingly glad of this, if in your judgment it could be without endangering positions and operations in the Southwest. To this Halleck replied on July 10th, Governor Sprague is here. If I were to go to Washington, I could advise but one thing, to place all the forces in North Carolina, Virginia, and Washington under one head, and hold that head responsible for the result. It is doubtful if Halleck measured fully the import of his language, or whether he realized the danger and burden of the responsibility which, if he did not invite, he at least thus voluntarily assumed. Nominally, he became General-in-Chief but in actual practice his genius fell short of the high duties of that great station. While he rendered memorable service to the Union, his judgment and resolution sometimes quailed before the momentous requirements of his office, and thrust back upon the President the critical and decisive acts which overawed him. In reality, he was from the first only what he afterwards became by technical orders, the President's Chief of Staff. End of chapter. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 20 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. General McClellan arrived at Fort Monroe on the morning of the 2nd of April, 1862, to begin the campaign against Richmond on the route chosen by himself. According to his own report, he had, the next day, ready to move 58,000 men and 100 guns, besides the division artillery. 
they were of the flower of the volunteer army and included also sykes brigade of regulars hunt's artillery reserve and several regiments of cavalry these were all on the spot prepared to march and an almost equal number were on their way to join him he seemed at first to appreciate the necessity for prompt and decisive action and with only one day's delay issued his orders for the march up the peninsula between the york and james rivers the first obstacle that he expected to meet was the force of general j b magruder at yorktown which mcclellan estimated at from fifteen thousand to twenty thousand magruder says his force consisted of eleven thousand of which six thousand were required for the fortifications of yorktown and only five thousand were left to hold the line across the peninsula thirteen miles in length his only object was to delay as long as possible the advance of the national troops upon richmond and his dispositions were made to that end if he had had troops enough he says that he would have made his line of defense between ship point on the york and the mouth of the warwick on the james but his force being insufficient for that purpose he took up as a second line the warwick river which heads only a mile or so from yorktown and empties into the james some thirteen miles to the south yorktown and its redoubts united by long curtains and flanked by rifle pits formed the left of his line which was continued by the warwick river a sluggish and boggy stream running through a dense wood fringed with swamps the stream was dammed in two places at wind's mill and at lee's mill and magruder constructed three more dams to back up the river and make the fords impassable each of these dams was protected by artillery and earthworks general mcclellan was ignorant not only of these preparations made to receive him but also of the course of the river and the nature of the ground through which it ran he knew something of the disposition of magruder's outposts on his first line and rightly conjectured that they would retire as he advanced his orders for the fourth of april were therefore punctually carried out and he seemed to expect no greater difficulty in his plan for the next day he divided his force into two columns heintzelman to take the right and march directly to yorktown and keys taking the road to the left to push on to the halfway house in the rear of yorktown on the williamsburg road he expected keys to be there the same day to occupy the narrow ridge in that neighborhood to prevent the escape of the garrison at yorktown by land and to prevent reinforcements from being thrown in heintzelman went forward to the place assigned him in front of yorktown meeting with little opposition keys marched by the road assigned him until he came to the enemy's fortified position at lee's mill which to use general mcclellan's words he found altogether stronger than was expected unapproachable by reason of the warwick river and incapable of being carried by assault the energetic and active campaign that day begun was at once given up two days of reconnaissances convinced him that he could not break through the line which magruder's little army of eleven thousand men had stretched across the peninsula and he resolved upon a regular siege of the place he began at the same time that campaign of complaint and rec recrimination against the government which he kept up as long as he remained in the service he always ascribed the failure of his campaign at this point to two causes first to the want of assistance by the navy in reducing yorktown and second to the retention of mcdowell's corps in front of washington if the navy had silenced the batteries at yorktown and gloucester he contended he could have gone up the peninsula unchecked this is unquestionably true it would be equally true to say in general terms that if somebody else would do our work we would have no work to do he brings no proof to show that he had any right to expect that the navy would do this for him it is true that he asked before he left washington that the navy might cooperate with him in this plan and received in reply the assurance that the navy would render him all the assistance in its power the sworn testimony of captain fox the assistant secretary of the navy and admiral goldsborough shows that nothing was promised that was not performed and that the navy stood ready to give 
and did give all the assistance to the army which was possible captain fox said wooden vessels could not have attacked the batteries at yorktown and gloucester with any degree of success the forts at yorktown were situated too high were beyond the reach of naval guns and i understand that general mcclellan never expected any attack to be made on them by the navy admiral goldsborough's evidence is to the same effect he promised that the merrimac should never go up the york river and she did not he did everything that general mcclellan requested of him his orders from the department were clear and urgent though general he was to extend the army at all times any and all aid that he could render and he never refused to honor any draft that was made upon him the greatest of mcclellan's grievances was the retention of mcdowell's corps and his clamor in regard to this was so loud and long as to blind many careless readers and writers to the facts of the case we have stated them already but they may be briefly recapitulated here a council of war of general mcclellan's corps commanders called by himself had decided that washington could not be safely left without a covering force of fifty five thousand including the garrisons of the forts when he had gone general wadsworth reported that he had left only nineteen thousand and had ordered away nearly half of these two eminent generals in the war department investigated this statement and found it true whereupon the president ordered that mcdowell's corps should for the present remain within reach of washington mcclellan took with him to the peninsula an ag aggregate force of over one hundred thousand men afterwards largely increased his own morning report of the thirteenth of april signed by himself and his adjutant general shows that he had with him actually present for duty one hundred thousand nine hundred seventy with this overwhelming superiority of numbers he could have detached thirty thousand men at any moment to do the work that he had intended mcdowell to do but all the energy he might have employed in this work he diverted in attacking the administration at washington which was doing all that it could do to support and provide for his army the attitude of the president towards him at this time may be seen from the following letter of the ninth of april in which mr lincoln answers mcclellan's complaints with as much consideration and kindness as a father would use towards a querulous and petulant child your dispatches complaining that you are not properly sustained while they do not offend me do pain me very much blenker's division was withdrawn from you before you left here and you know the pressure under which i did it and as i thought acquiesced in it certainly not without reluctance after you left i ascertained that less than twenty thousand unorganized men without a single field battery were all you designed to be left for the defense of washington and manassas junction and part of this even was to go to general hooker's old position general banks's corps once designed for manassas junction was diverted and tied up on the line of winchester and strasburg and could not leave it without again exposing the upper potomac and the baltimore and ohio railroad this presented or would present when mcdowell and sumner should be gone a great temptation to the enemy to turn back from their appahannock and sack washington my explicit order that washington should by the judgment of all the commanders of army corps be left entirely secure had been neglected it was precisely this that drove me to detain mcdowell i do not forget that i was satisfied with your arrangement to leave banks at manassas junction but when that arrangement was broken up and nothing was substituted for it of course i was constrained to substitute something for it myself and allow me to ask do you really think i should permit the line from richmond via manassas junction to this city to be entirely open except what resistance could be presented by less than twenty thousand unorganized troops this is a question which the country will not allow me to evade there is a curious mystery about the number of troops now with you when i telegraphed you 
on the sixth saying that you had over one hundred thousand with you i had just obtained from the secretary of war a statement taken as he said from your own returns making a hundred and eight thousand then with you and en route to you you now say that you have but eighty five thousand when all en route to you shall have reached you how can the discrepancy of twenty three thousand be accounted for as to general wool's command i understand that it is doing for you precisely what a like number of your own would have to do if that command was away i suppose the whole force which has gone forward for you is with you by this time and if so i think that it is the precise time for you to strike a blow by delay the enemy will relatively gain upon you that is he will gain faster by fortifications and reinforcements than you can by reinforcements alone and once more let me tell you it is indispensable to you that you strike a blow i am powerless to help this you will do me the justice to remember i always insisted that going down the bay in search of a field instead of fighting at or near manassas was only shifting and not surmounting a difficulty that we would find the same enemy and the same or equal entrenchments at either place the country will not fail to note is now noting that the present hesitation to move upon an entrenched enemy is but the story of manassas repeated i beg to assure you that i have never written you or spoken to you in greater kindness of feeling than now nor with a fuller purpose to sustain you so far as in my most anxious judgment i consistently can but you must act these considerations produced no impression upon general mcclellan from the beginning to the end of the siege of yorktown his dispatches were one incessant cry for men and guns these the government furnished to the utmost extent possible but nothing contented him his hallucination of overwhelming forces opposed to him began again as violent as it was during the winter on the eighth of april he wrote to admiral goldsborough i am probably weaker than they now are or soon will be his distress is sometimes comic in its expression he writes on the seventh of april the warwick river grows worse the more you look at it while demanding mcdowell's corps en bloc he asked on the fifth for franklin's division and on the tenth repeated this request saying that although he wanted more he would be responsible for the results if franklin's division were sent him the government overborne by his importunity gave orders the same day that franklin's division should go to him and the arrangements for transporting it were made with the greatest diligence he was delighted with this news and although the weather was good and the roads improving he did nothing but throw up earthworks until they came they arrived on the twentieth and no use whatever was made of them he kept them in the transports in which they had come down the bay more than two weeks in fact until the day before the siege ended it is hard to speak with proper moderation of such a disposition of this most valuable force so clamorously demanded by general mcclellan and so generously sent him by the president general webb the intimate friend and staff officer of mcclellan thus speaks of it the latter officer lieutenant colonel alexander of the corps of engineer was then instructed to devise the proper arrangements and superintend the landing of the troops but extraordinary as it may seem more than two weeks were consumed in the preliminaries and when everything was nearly ready for the disembarkation the enemy had vanished from the scene how long it would have taken the whole of mcdowell's corps to disembark at this rate the reader may judge and yet for days it had been general mcclellan's pet project in connection with his plan of campaign to utilize mcdowell in just this manner as a flanking column the simple truth is there was never an hour during general mcclellan's command of the army that he had not more troops than he knew what to do with yet he was always instinctively calling for more mr stanton one day said of him with natural hyperbole if he had a million men he would swear the enemy had two millions and then he would sit down in the mud and yell for three 
he repeatedly telegraphed to washington that he expected to fight an equal or greater force in fact all the available force of the rebels in the neighborhood of yorktown we have the concurrent testimony of all the confederate authorities that no such plan was ever thought of magruder's intentions as well as his orders from richmond were merely to delay mcclellan's advance as long as practicable his success in this purpose surpassed his most sanguine expectations in the early days of april he was hourly expecting an attack at some point on his thinly defended line of thirteen miles guarded as he says by only five thousand men exclusive of the six thousand who garrisoned yorktown but to my utter surprise he continues he permitted day after day to elapse without an assault at last no less to his astonishment than to his delight magruder discovered that mcclellan was beginning a regular siege which meant a gain of several weeks for the rebel defense of richmond and absolute safety for the concentration of rebel troops in the meantime it is now perfectly clear that mcclellan could have carried out the line of magruder by assault at any time during the early days of april from the mass of testimony to this effect before us we will take only two or three expressions of the highest authority general a s webb says that the warwick line could have been readily broken within a week after the army's arrival before it we now know general heinzelman says in his evidence before the committee on the conduct of the war i think if i had been permitted when i first landed on the peninsula to advance i could have isolated the troops in yorktown and the place would have been fallen in a few days but my orders were very stringent not to make any demonstration general barnard mcclellan's chief of engineers says in his final report of the campaign that the lines of yorktown should have been assaulted there is reason to believe that they were not held by strong force when our army appeared before them and we know that they were far from complete our troops toiled a month in the trenches or lay in the swamps of the warwick we lost few men by the siege but disease took a fearful hold of the army and toil and hardship unrelieved by the excitement of combat impaired the morale we did not carry with us from yorktown so good an army as we took there the testimony of the enemy is the same johnston so soon as he came to examine it regarded the position of recruiter as clearly untenable saw that mcclellan could not be defeated there that the line was too long to be successfully defended that the backwater was as much a protection to one side as the other that there was a considerable unfortified space between yorktown and the head of the stream open to attack and that the position could at any time be turned by way of the york river everyone seemed to see it except general mcclellan he went on sending dispatches every day to washington for heavier guns and more men digging a colossal system of earthworks for gradual approach on one side of an entrenched camp of no strategic value whatever the rear of which was entirely open preparing with infinite labor and loss the capture of a place without a prisoner the effect of which at the best would be merely to push an army back upon its reserves even so late as the sixteenth of april an opportunity to break magruder's line was clearly presented to mcclellan and rejected he had ordered general w f smith to reconnoiter a position known as dam number no. one between lee's and wynn's mills where there was a crossing covered by a one-gun battery of the enemy for this purpose smith pushed brooks vermont brigade with mott's battery somewhat close to the dam carrying on a sharp fire from this point he examined at his leisure and in fact controlled the position opposite finding it feebly defended a young officer of brooks's staff lieutenant e m noyes crossed the river below the dam where the water was only waist deep and approached within fifty yards of the enemy's works returning after this daring feat he repeated his observations to general smith and to general mcclellan who had arrived on the ground 
and had ordered Smith to bring up his entire division to hold the advanced position occupied by Brooks's brigade. Smith, who perceived the importance of Noyes's intelligence, obtained permission to send a party across the stream to see if the enemy's works had been sufficiently denuded to enable a column to effect a lodgment. Four companies of the 3rd Vermont, numbering 200 men, under Captain F. C. Harrington, were ordered to cross the river to ascertain the true state of affairs. They dashed through the stream, and in a few moments gained the enemy's rifle pits, where they maintained themselves with the utmost gallantry for half an hour. The enemy was thrown into great confusion by this bold and utterly unexpected movement. There were still several hours of daylight left, and another attempt was made to cross at the same point, with a force no larger than Harrington's, assisted by a diversion of an equal force at the dam above. But the enemy, being now thoroughly aroused and concentrated, the crossing was not made. It appears from General Smith's report that no attempt to mass the troops of the division for an assault was made. The only intention seemed to be to secure us the enemy's works if we found them abandoned. He adds, The moment I found resistance serious and the numbers opposed great, I acted in obedience to the warning instructions of the General-in-Chief and withdrew the small number of troops exposed from under fire. Thus, says General Webb, a fair opportunity to break the Warwick line was missed. The importance of this incident may be best appreciated by reading General Magruder's account of it. He calls it a serious attempt to break his line at the weakest part. If, instead of two hundred men, Smith had felt authorized to push over his entire division, the Peninsular Campaign might have had a very different termination. McClellan announced the movement of General Smith in a somewhat excited dispatch to the War Department, which Mr. Stanton answered with still more enthusiastic congratulations. "'Good for the first lick!' he shouts. "'Hurrah for Smith and the one-gun battery!' Showing the intense eagerness of the government to find motives for satisfaction and congratulation in McClellan's conduct. But there was no sequel to the movement." Indeed, General McClellan's dispatches indicate considerable complacency that Smith was able to hold the position gained. General Webb says, Reconnaissances were made, but no assaulting columns were ever organized to take advantage of any opportunity offered. No congratulations or encouragements from the government now availed anything with McClellan. Struggling with a command and a responsibility too heavy for him, he had fallen into a state of mind in which prompt and energetic action was impossible. His double illusion of an overpowering force of the enemy in his front, and of a government at Washington that desired the destruction of his army, was always present with him, paralyzing all his plans and actions. In his private letters, he speaks of Washington as that sink of iniquity, of the people in authority as those treacherous hounds, of the predicament he is in, the rebels on one side and the abolitionists and other scoundrels on the other. I feel, he says, that the fate of a nation depends upon me, and I feel that I have not one single friend at the seat of government. This at a moment when the government was straining every nerve to support him. The Confederates, as Mr. Lincoln had said, were daily strengthening their position by fortification and reinforcement. On the 17th of April, General Joseph E. Johnston took command on the peninsula. He says that his force, after the arrival of G.W. Smith's and Longstreet's divisions, amounted to about 53,000 men, including 3,000 sick. He places the force of McClellan at 133,000, including Franklin's division of 13,000 floating idly on their transports. He did nothing more than to observe the Union army closely, to complete the fortifications between Yorktown and the inundations of the Warwick, and to hold his own forces in readiness for a movement to the rear. He kept himself informed of the progress of McClellan's engineering work against Yorktown, as it was not his intention to remain long enough to spend an hour under fire. He did not expect to be hurried. 
he had long before that given his opinion that mcclellan did not especially value time every day of delay was of course an advantage but an additional day or two gained by enduring a cannonade would have been dearly bought in blood and he therefore determined to go before mcclellan's powerful artillery should open him upon him seeing as we now can what was occurring upon both sides of the warwick river there is something humiliating and not without a touch of the pathetic in the contrast between the clear vision of johnston and the blindness of mcclellan in relation to each other's attitude and purpose while the former was simply watching for the flash of the first guns to take his departure glad of every day that the firing was postponed but entirely indifferent to the enormous development of the siege works going on in his sight the latter was toiling with prodigious industry and ability over his vast earthworks and his formidable batteries only pausing to send importune dispatches to washington for more guns and more soldiers forbidding the advance of a picket beyond specified limits carefully concealing every battery until all should be finished not allowing a gun to be fired until the whole thunderous chorus should open at once firmly convinced that when he was entirely ready he would fight and destroy the whole rebel army nearly one hundred heavy parrot guns mortars and howitzers were placed in battery against the town and camp of yorktown and its outlying works only fifteen hundred or two thousand yards away against the opinion of his ablest staff officers mcclellan kept this immense armament silent for weeks while he was continually adding to it general barnard chief of engineers says we should have opened our batteries on the place as fast as they were completed general barry chief of artillery says the ease with which the one hundred and two hundred pounders of this battery battery number one were worked the extraordinary accuracy of their fire and the since ascertained effects produced upon the enemy by it force upon me the conviction that the fire of guns of similar caliber and power in the other batteries at much shorter ranges combined with the cross vertical fire of the thirteen and ten inch seacoast mortars would have compelled the enemy to surrender or abandon his works in less than twelve hours general mcclellan's only reason for refusing the, to allow the batteries to open fire as they were successively finished was the fear that they would be silenced by the converging fire of the enemy as soon as they betrayed their position that this was a gross error is shown by the confederate reports they were perfectly cognizant of the progress and disposition of his batteries the very good reason why they did not annoy him in their construction was that the union lines were to use johnston's words beyond the range of our old-fashioned ship guns a few experimental shots were fired upon the shore batteries on the first of may the effect of them convinced the confederate general of the enormous surplus strength of the federal artillery the shots from their first volley fell in the camp of the confederate reserve a mile and a half beyond the village how long general mcclellan would have continued this futile labor if he had been left alone it, it is impossible to conjecture if there was at first a limit in his own mind to the work to be done and the time to be consumed it must have been continually moved forward until it passed out of sight up to the last moment he was still making demands which would have taken weeks to fill the completion of one work was simply an incentive to the beginning of another thus on the twenty eighth of april a week after franklin's arrival at a time when johnston was already preparing to start for richmond he telegraphs to washington as a pleasant bit of news that he had commenced a new battery from the right of the first parallel and adds would be glad to have the thirty-pounder parrots in the works around washington at once and very short of that excellent gun it is not difficult to imagine how such a dispatch at such a time smote upon the intense anxiety of the president he answered in wonder and displeasure your call for parrot guns from washington alarms me chiefly because it argues indefinite procrastination is anything to be done but the general 
busy with his trenches and his epaulments, paid no regard to this searching question. Two days later, May 1st, he continued his cheery report of new batteries and rifle pits, and adds, Enemy still in force and working hard, and these stereotyped phrases continued, with no premonition of any immediate change, until on the 4th he telegraphed, Yorktown is in our possession, and later in the day began to magnify his victory, telling what spoils he had captured, and ending with the sounding phrases, No time shall be lost, I shall push the enemy to the wall. Johnston had begun his preparation to move on the 27th of April, and on the 3rd of May, finding that McClellan's batteries were now ready to open, a fact apparently not yet known to McClellan, he gave orders for the evacuation, which began at midnight. He marched away from Yorktown with about 50,000 men. General McClellan, by his own morning report of the 30th of April, had in his camps and trenches, and scrambling in haste on board the transports that they had quitted the day before, an aggregate of 112,392 present for duty, the total aggregate present and absent being 130,378. End of chapter 20